Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. This is part two of my discussion with Professor Sabah al-Nasri, who teaches Middle Eastern politics at York University, is Iraqi, and uh, recently edited the book Arab Revolutions and Beyond. We're coming to you from Toronto. Thank you, Sabah, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. So I, I think what we want to focus on in this segment is the dynamics of revolutionary change in an age of globalism right. and neoliberalism, right. uh, how it will look like revolutions in the past and how it will look like something else. And I know this is something you have examined. Right, right. Um, I will start with the end of the Cold War and the breakdown of the Soviet Union. And because this world historical context is very important in understanding any kind of politics, revolutionary or otherwise. Since the 90s, we, we observed the, the, the dominant political form in Europe, the United States, but also the other parts of the world, is populism. Before, at least until the 70s, political parties were organized around uh, specific classes, articulate interests of classes, the social democracy for the working class, etc. But since the 90s, you, the, the dominant political form of the ruling classes is populism. And, and that's, not, uh, that's not a coincidence with this neoliberal offensive, with half of the world open to be conquered by neoliberalism after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. Um, there's a, a radical shift in the form of politics, articulation of interest, representation, etc. So what we see is that the majority of the population in a worldwide scale, actually are excluded from the political system, are not represented, their interests are not articulated. So I believe that within this context, and that's why the current revolutions are different than the historical one, that revolutions and revol revolt probably is the only political form available for the popular classes to introduce a radical change in, 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 in the Constitution. Well, I, I agree completely, yeah. and that is the thesis of my own book, Wages of Rebellion. Um, but what about nationalism? I mean, nationalism still remains a powerful force. Yes, yes and no, because nationalism now is embedded in an international or global context. So even nationalist movement, if they, if they are not linked to a wider movement, and solidarity and support, their prospect of, of success is almost zero. You can see this, take the example of Syriza in Greece. Right. Syriza, the, the first right approach was to say that you need a, a, a Europe-wide movement and solidarity in order to empower Syriza and Greece to deal with the European Central Bank, with the IMF, etc., and the, and the EU Commission, etc. So there's a sense of embedding nationalist or national, let's say, movement within a wider context, a regional or international context. I think this is very important. It's different than the old form of internationalism in three instances. The first one, it was mostly European-centered, not international in this sense. The second point is it was mostly class-based. And third, all these revolt and revolution were organized by a political party with a strong leadership. But that wasn't true for the Communist Party. There was an internationalist element to that. Yeah, but again, if you look at it historically, we'll see mostly within Europe. There are some connection to other parts of the, of the world, but mostly it was within Europe. And, and I think that's a, a big difference today. We have, you can, you can call it the first international of the people. It is cross-class, it's not nation or nation-state centered, and it's not articulated, organized by a specific political party. But wouldn't it be fair to say, let's yeah. look at the Arab world. Right. Wouldn't it be correct to say that within Arab resistance yeah. movements, there's yeah. actually quite an antagonistic split between nationalists and, let's call them, internationalists. Yes. And you see that with 
uh, the split within jihadist movements. Yes. So let's take Al Qaeda, for instance. Yeah. Al Qaeda was a, a movement that had no loyalty to any particular nation Correct. state, mm -hmm. which is why they condemned Hamas as apostates, yeah. um, because uh, or or broke with the Algerian uh, resistance movement, mm -hmm. the Gamal Islamia, yeah. uh, because they were focused on the liberation of a particular. Within, country. Within, uh, yes. And this has been a conflict within, yes. now we have the creation of ISIS, yes. which is forming a new state, yes. a new caliphate, yes. but, and not, in essence, uh, you know, uh, attempting to uh, play to either uh, Syrian yes. or Iraqi nationalism, but yes. I wonder if that split is still powerful. Yeah, I mean, we have the juxtaposition of two different times and temporalities here. The first one is, when you talk about Hamas, or the the, the Islamic for, uh, Front right. in Algeria, etc. These movements were, you know, formed during the Cold War, during the bipolar world mm -hmm. order, and within a specific context, right? Whereas Al Qaeda or Islamic State and so on is the post Cold War right. uh, world context. And again, you have, as I said, the juxtaposition of two different temporalities. Yes, still national and sometimes nationalist movement matter in, 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 in this struggle, but th there, prospects of success, as I said, is almost zero if they are not um, embedded in a wider coalition, a platform of different forces, regionally and internationally. But there's no common ideology. I mean, what's the ideology? That's, that's a good point. Not only there is no you know, centralizing force like a political party and as a strong leadership, in the case of the ISIS, yes, there is a strong leadership. But uh, if we took a, uh, look at the wider region, there is no strong political parties and strong leadership to strategically organize and articulate all these Which interests. is what n the Nasser, the Ba'athists who rose out of yes. Nasser's revolution yes. did throughout the Correct. Arab world in Syria and Iraq. Correct. And that is up until the 90s, but then it shifted in the 90s. Even the Ba'athists were... Well, bankrupted. they discredited themselves, but exactly. we don't mm -hmm. have... I mean, that yeah. secular idiot... And part of the reason yeah. within the Arab world or the Muslim world, that people turn yes. to orthodox religious movements yes. is because of the bankruptcy yes. of these secular, yes. nationalist, right. liberation movements. So we have the lack of political form, a popular form, to articulate these demands and so on, needs of the people. And you're right, there's the ideological moment. The crisis of the secular, so-called secular political parties and movement and so on, and there are no other alternative except neoliberalism, privatization, and corruption. It's not only that people turn to religion, but we shouldn't forget, too, that these religious forces were already active in the region during the Cold War. And mostly, think about it, it they were supported by imperialist power. So they were already active. And then in the time of the crisis, political crisis, ideological crisis, they were the only one eh, that can appeal to the people and challenge whatever political system in, in, in place. If you look at, for instance, what I, where, what I have termed 20th century jihadism, it started within the First World War when Germany, for instance, were using Muslim against France and, England, and the UK and, and vice versa. So each... Let me just throw that in. That was true in Yugoslavia. The Ustasha, the fascist right. regime, yeah. was raising Muslim battalions to fight the Serbs. Correct. That I was criticizing when I was in Germany all these, you know, Islamophobia against Muslim and they don't belong to us. And I was saying, people, the first mosque was built in, in Germany was during the First World War and it was done by the German states right. for prisoners, uh, mostly from North, North Africa, Arab Muslims who used to serve at the French army. When they were captured as prisoners, they put, put them in extra camp, separate from other prisoners and built a mosque for them to use Islam as an anti-French, anti-British political force. During the Second World, uh, the, 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 after the Second World War, you can see the U.S. utilizing Islam. Muslim Brotherhood is a case, a, a right. good case here. Uh, Sayyid Qutb, who right. went, he was a social democrat until 1948, until he went we to the U.S. We should say that he's sort of the founding of father, the Egyptian intellectual of, let's call it modern jihadism, very large influence on Osama bin Laden. Right. Exactly. So he shifted. Uh, after he came back from the U.S. because he was socialized in a very orientalist way. And Islam was used, uh, a prominent figure here is Bernard Louise, where he went in the United States. He was arguing in the 50s we should use, use Islam as an anti-communist force. So you have these forces already operating within these states, but they were not popular compared to the, to the socialists or nationalists and so on. With the breakdown of the Soviet Union, 
and the neurable offensive, this regime was discredited. This ideology was discredited. So the only force in place were these religious forces, right? So they filled this vacuum, well, the ideological political they, vacuum. They also, I think, had a correct yes. critique of the decadence and moral decay of modern society. I don't embrace what they propose, yes. but, but I think many people forget that their critique, yes. and this is part of the attraction of ISIS, yes. of the hollowness, yes. the hedonism yes. uh, of modern consumer culture is not wrong. Right. Right. Yeah, correct, but the, I think what, what, what is m much more important for young people who join this movement is not so much the ideological appeal, because they consider them, themselves Muslim anyway. But what, as I said, what attracted them is the lack of vision, lack of alternative, lack of the, of the possibilities of having a normal life. Right. Eh? If you are in Egypt and anywhere, you are a young person and you want to get married, the expectation is you should have own apartment. Right. You well, will never is, ever be able to afford right. an own apartment. This is true apartment. in Gaza, you know, in Palestine. As Absolutely. Well. Yeah. So the material right. needs, the basic material needs of people which are not satisfied, I think that's the core, well, the know, core issue. I spent a lot of time in Gaza and yes. one of the things, there were a couple of things I noticed about yeah. Hamas. Yeah. Um, one, if you live in a refugee camp like Jabalia or Han yeah. Yunus, yeah. Uh, as you said, you're, you know, you have no job, no prospects of getting married, uh, you can't leave because you can't you're leave, in, trapped in the largest yes. open-air prison yes. uh, administered by the Israeli government yes. in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, you have no way to affirm yourself uh, other than to become a jihadist. Yes. And that was the attraction of becoming a shahid, a martyr. Right. Because on the day you became a shahid, yeah. uh, Hamas would come into the little dirt, you know, warren where your concrete hovel was, yeah. and they would put out white plastic chairs, yeah. and they would put your picture up on the wall, right. uh, and you would become somebody. Yeah. And I think that... And support the fa your family, too. They would support the family. Yes. You know, I spent enough time there to know that oftentimes the family were very unhappy yes. that their son had become a shahid. Yeah. Um, but uh, when you repress, yes. and most of the Arab world is young, yes. when you repress... Yes. I mean, in Gaza, 75% are under the age of 25, 50%, I think, Correct. under the age of 18. Correct. But that's just endemic throughout the Arab world, also yes. true in Egypt, yes. with those kinds of numbers. When you repress people and they have no other way to affirm themselves, right. but in essence through death, right. um, that is the route they're going to take. Yes. And I think that the breakdown of the society, yes. including in Western culture, yes. uh, has been the prime impetus yes. behind this movement. And then also identity. Yes. So if you go to the Banlus, the, these uh, kind of Stalinist housing projects that where they house North African immigrants yeah. in France, yeah. whether it's in exactly. Paris, the Cité de Casmille, or in Lyon, or anywhere else, exactly. they may have been born in Algeria, yeah. or may have been born in Tunisia, or Egypt, or anywhere else, but they came to Europe at a young age, yes. excluded from the society Correct. physically, Correct. Uh, you know, the Europe, and especially France, is a deeply racist yeah. country. Yeah. Um, they go back to Algeria, yeah. but they're French. Yeah, Algerian, yes, of they, course. So, mm. they, they, at least they're seen as French. Yes. They come back to Europe, they're not seen exactly. as European or French. Yes. Yes. And that crisis of identity, yes. I think, I have you comment on, but I think mm. has also been yes. uh, part of the driving factor that's pushed so many young people in yes. Europe and in the Middle East right. into the arms of jihadists. Correct. I mean, this refers to a wider picture, I think, and the role of the religion. Um, in Europe, it, it takes the form of Islamophobia, for instance, and maybe North America, too. Um, whereas in the Middle East, as you said, it appeals most, mostly to the popular classes, young people, right. to join actual religious movement. So we need to discuss, and I think this is an interesting phenomenon, why religion became so important, so popular after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, and especially with this new liberal imperialist offensive, why religion became even government, you know, you think about the new cons and their fundamentalist worldview, why it became so important. And I think, uh, just a hypothesis uh, I want to discuss on a panel in September is religion in different form, be it Islamophobia or, you know, the new cons or the an original power in the Middle East, is the form through which the crisis of hegemony can be processed. 
for lack of alternative. Because there's no way there will be a real shift in the constellation of power and disposition and accumulation. So ideology becomes, and especially in religious form, become, I think, the prominent place through which ruling classes can process the crisis of hegemony. Most of the people in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, they don't feel represented by the political parties. They feel excluded, even if they are citizens, even if they are white, German, white, whatever. They don't feel they are represented uh, as citizens. So I think there's a crisis of hegemony here, of the political parties, of the political system in general. And on the other hand, they feel they have no say in the real issues. If you look at, for instance, again, you got Europe, and how the crisis is, is um, um, discussed at what level, behind closed doors, within the EU Commission, on the M, and imposed on countries. So people f feel alienated nationally and regionally. And I think religion here still plays a role. Well, it plays a role class. because, it, like all yeah. revolutionary, or most, yes. if not all, revolutionary ideologies, yes. it's utopian. Mm -hmm. It's hearkening mm -hmm. back to a time of yes. purity because yeah. they're always talking yeah. about yeah you know, uh, the the age of the prophet. Right. Uh, and uh, that, in many ways, that jihadist movement replicates yes. the utopian vision of communism. Correct. But but again, as I said, it's, it's a con contradiction because the same religious phenomena, on the one hand, plays, as I said, maybe a form of liberation and so on. But at the other t uh, on the other hand, it is used to sustain the status quo Think about, let's say, Islamophobia and so on. So the same religious phenomena take different form depending on the context in which you find yourself, right? In the context of the Middle East, with the lack of alternative and the, you know, the, 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 the bankruptcy of all these regimes, you know, religion might become a very popular force. Think about al-Sadr. He was appealing to his followers in Iraq, and he had 100,000 followers, to join the Monday and this Friday protest against the government and the lack of services against corruption and so on. And he was appealing to them to, to protest in a national sense, not in a sectarian sense. We're talking about the Shiite leader in Iraq. Exactly. So you can have this form of religion playing probably a progressive role within the specific context, whereas in, in Europe and North America, it has a very regressive status quo cementing racist Islamophobic form. But the question that uh, I well, think Well, let me just interrupt to, yeah, by saying yeah. that, that that Islamophobia yeah actually fuels the movement. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. it validates Correct. Correct. the ideology Correct. itself. Correct. As the and, and, and I think Correct. in the West they kind of want it that way. Yes. I, I don't think it's accidental. Yes. I think they want to reduce the human being, the complex identity of a human being to a very simplistic one. And that's what the United States but did by the way. It's worse than that. They want to mm. externalize evil. Yeah. embodied yeah. in this, this, is, these Islamic movements. Yes. And of course, in the age of neoliberalism, yeah. uh, in, industrial states speak to the rest of the world almost exclusively in the language of violence. That's what yes. neo, neocons have, no ideas. Yes. They, they see evil embodied in, uh, you know, in jihadist, yes. in jihadist right. movements, and they say these people have to be right. eradicated. Yes. And of course, the, the, the tragedy... Yeah as we've seen in Iraq, yeah. is that by speaking yes. in that language of violence, yeah. you ratchet up the violence. Yes. So if you brutalize Iraqis or Syrians, mm. as we have for mm. now, mm. you know, over a dozen years, mm. the brutalized become brutal. Right. And just as we bombed yeah. Cambodia yeah. and got Pol Pot, yeah. the, the indiscriminate violence, which um, most Americans who have not been in Iraq have no concept of, because they haven't been around these weapon systems, Hellfire missiles, cruise missiles, these are incredibly powerful right. and, and destructive right. devices. Right. And they're not, they're, in, they're indiscriminate in yes. terms of Correct. the numbers that they kill. Correct. Correct. And, Correct. Um, and, and that for me is what's so frightening yes. Yes. about the Western response, and in particular the American response, yes. is that they see the rise of ISIS. Yes. And they say, we just need more violence, Correct. which is what created the problem anyway. Correct. And I so mean, where are we yeah. going? What's, yeah. what's I mean, happening? I mean, you know, Chris, I mean, the, the, the function of the, let's say, the ideological function of the construction of the absolute evil is to justify all your evil. 
once you design the Islamic State or whatever as the absolute evil, whatever you do, all the means are justified. Right. So it, it fulfills a function, as I said, during this crisis. And I think that's why religion plays a, a significant role in politics today. And not only as they claim in the Middle East, but you can say in a worldwide scale. And I think this is a phenomenon that challenges, you know, um, lefties on a worldwide scale and how to deal with it. And the mistake of the left was for a long time, at least I, as I know it from the Middle Eastern left, they used to think in this modernist dichotomy of secular religious. Right. Secular is right. good, religious is bad. Right. Right. They never really paid attention and, and, and engaged seriously with religion. And, and, and it's kind of crude uh, way of reading Marx because Marx, when he criticized religion, he doesn't criticize people for being religious, but he criticized the social relation that makes religion so necessary for the people. That's the most, most productive way engaging with it without excluding people and demonizing people. And I think that's, uh, that's the way we should engage with it. Well, definitely. The, the, the problem is that the, you know, if we're going to call them the revolutionary forces yes. within Europe, yeah. within the industrialized world, yeah. they don't have a utopian ideology yeah. yes. that calls for that kind of self-sacrifice yes. or yeah. that offers an alternative vision yes. that the jihadist movements in the Muslim world do. Yes. Uh, but again, I mean, what gives me this optimism uh, as Gramsci would say, optimism of the will, despite the pessimism of the intellect, right. is that when you look at the Arab Revolution, for instance, in Tunisia and Egypt and so on, and you look at the current protests in Beirut and in, in, in Iraq, you can see at a specific point, people overcome all these um, distinctions, artificial borderlines, and act and argue in a non-religious way. That means they are, they are clearly aware of the limits of what these jihadists or whatever conservative group can offer. And they know that the problem cannot be solved through this form of religious, fundamentalist, whatever uh, organization. We need alternative. So the question is, what kind of alternative? And I think it's kind of trail and error. People have to work their way through and out the crisis to come up with a new organization, new type of well, parties. The, the new, problem yeah. with that is they've got the guns. Yes. We saw that in Egypt. Yeah. So the yes. secularists, yes. courtesy of Morsi yeah. from the Muslim Brotherhood, right. who's right. now in prison right. and facing the death sentence right. and was overthrown by Sisi, right. is that they actually built an alliance with yeah. the military in an effort to placate the military, and they used physical force to Correct. crush the secularists. Correct. That's Correct. Exhaust what happened in Iran yes. when Khomeini came back. Yeah. Correct. And I think that's why I'm saying now even nationalists or national movement cannot succeed mm. if it's not organically linked um, in a wider context. Like, for instance, it's almost impossible for the people in the Middle East, especially the young people, to introduce any radical change without people in the United States or Canada and Europe actually engaging and pushing their governments not to intervene right. in their affairs. Right, no, it's the, so, it's the occupation and the intervention, but the problem yes. is that, that we, they speak the language we taught them to speak, yes. which is violence. Yes. And as you have correctly yes. pointed yes. out, the Arab Spring, yeah. the peaceful protests which yeah. lasted a year in Iraq, the yeah. mass demonstrations, were all nonviolent. Correct. And what was the response of essentially proxy states right. for the American Empire right. was to gun them down in the streets. Yes. And when you gun people down in the streets yeah. like that, you know, Nietzsche kind of got it. You, yes. you, you create the monster you get. Yes. And, 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 and that is, for me, the, the tragedy of what's yes. happened, that, yeah. that, the, that the, the centrifugal force within yes. the Arab world was nonviolent, right. was secular, right. but the forces that we support, yes. whether in Egypt or whether in Iraq, Absolutely. pulled out automatic weapons and shot these people down. Absolutely. And that's yes. how we got ISIS. Yeah. But maybe two, as I said, po maybe positive moments. The first one from Tunisia, when Ben Ali told his general to shoot at the people. The general responded, since when we shoot at, at our own people? At that moment, Ben Ali realized he doesn't have any power. He collapsed. The second one was yesterday. I was reading about the protests in Iraq, mm. and it was a beautiful example of how things can shift. Mm. One police officer was sent by his commander to, as an agent provocateur to actually destroy the protests. What he did, he went to the protest and he took his cell phone and on the public, he mentioned the commander 
who sent him to be an agent provocateur and, pro and destroy the protest, expose himself and his commander in front of the people. This is something new. Right. And I think these examples give us some hope that despite the violence and terror and all these conservative fundamentalist setbacks, I think people will overcome these limits and difficulties and come up with a different v vision, different maybe perspective for the future. But again, you're right, it will be accompanied by right. violence, a massive right. Right. amount of violence. But I think there's no other way out. Well, inshallah. <laughs> they say in Arabic, Yom Fil Mishmish. We eat apricots, which means Correct. it will never happen. Correct. <laughs> Correct. It will never happen, depending on, on the time frame <laughs> we think of. In the short term, you're right. But I don't know what is the impact of the Arab Revolution in the middle long, long right. run. Uh, just like we don't know, actually, what is the impact of the French Revolution in 1789. Right. That's right. Yeah. So that's why I think we, we shouldn't you know, give up hope. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me on a shack. <laughs>